you ever look back at any of your friendships that you have now and think about how embarrassed you are of how they started? Uh, well, this, this episode might be for you then. This is a great conversation that I had with Dave Burgess, and it's a really vulnerable conversation that we have, and we talk about our friendship, uh, how we connected. But if you don't know Dave Burgess, he's actually the head of Dave Burgess Consulting. I'm partners with him. Uh, we own a publishing company together called Impress. He was actually the person who, uh, who actually published The Innovator's Mindset with his wonderful wife, Shelley Burgess. And they approached me, and it was just... Uh, an amazing opportunity to actually write for them and to to work with them over the time and so in this conversation we talk about how we first met and it's a it's a really powerful story now the audio didn't process properly so the audio is not great in this one and i was thinking about re-recording it but i thought the conversation was just so good that i don't think i could capture it uh the way that we had so we talk about the first time we met and it's it's embarrassing to be honest with you but i think it's a really good story and i think it's a powerful takeaway um for those that you know take the time to listen to it and for me it was something that i really grew from but we also talk about publishing, we talk about education, and we just talk about our friendship. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos, and welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. This is actually the first Innovators Mindset Podcast of the 2021 year, and I'm very excited to have a very special guest who is a uh, also a very good friend of mine, uh, Dave Burgess from Teach Like a Pirate fame. And I'm sure many of you listening uh, know Dave very well. And I've been blessed uh, to work with Dave for the last several years. And I, I, I want to just say, first of all, thank you for all that you've done for myself, but also that I can, the story that I have and how, you know, you really help elevate my voice. Um, you and Shelly and, and your entire team is not a story that only I have. I know that you've done a lot to elevate so many educators around the world and, and really get their voices out in, in a really powerful way. So I am so honored to have you. I'm excited to have a, a good conversation with a good friend um, over the next little while. So Dave, just introduce yourself and, and tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you do in education. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, George. It's an honor to be on the Innovators Mindset podcast. I'm an avid listener as well. So it's exciting to be on the show. And it's been an honor to work with you over the last several years as well and to help you amplify your message and, and spread it around the world and to see the impact that that message has had on schools and teachers and then ultimately students has been, uh, it's been, it's been amazing. So it's very cool. I'm Dave Burgess. I'm the president of Dave Burgess Consulting Incorporated, and I'm uh, based in San Diego, California. I was a high school teacher for 17 years, a basketball coach for several of those years as well, and uh, the, and now work with my wife Shelley and the DBC team to publish educational books uh, around the globe. So, like, what what actually you know you had taught for a long time, and I know you're very revered as a teacher. And to be honest with you. Um, I know this and it's not there. Obviously, there is some bias there because I know you and I'm good friends with you. And I, I know the stuff that you talk about, but I actually know a lot of people that you taught with, um, you know, in my and they always, you know, talk about how, how much they admired uh, the work that you're doing. So in, in your work as an educator, what happened that all of a sudden you're um, publishing books and, and trying and bringing voice on educators? Like, what was that process that led you to that point? Yeah, and so I think what happened, Tim Ferriss, um, famous entrepreneur, he has this phrase that he says that if you're looking to be an entrepreneur, one of the best ways to do it is to look to scratch your own itch. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what happened for me is that when I was, I was traveling, I was doing workshops, I was speaking, I didn't have a book and I got offered a publishing contract and I read the publishing contract and I always tell this story. I went straight up into my hotel room. I Googled publishing contracts because I thought that she was trying to cheat me when I read it. And when I Googled them, I found out she wasn't trying to cheat me. That's exactly what contracts look like in the publishing world. And to me, the only thing missing was a ski mask and a gun. I just couldn't believe it. So we did a ton of research and we decided we didn't want to sign it. We formed our own publishing company. We published Teach Like a Pirate right from the kitchen table, right off a laptop at the kitchen table. 
And so what we tried to do with Dave Rivers Consulting is we try to take all of the things that I was upset about in the contract, all the things that I wanted from a publisher, all the things that I wanted to be able to still maintain control of though, I, want, I wanted to have creative control. I wanted to have more control of the, the, the royalties and the finances, but I also wanted to, someone to be able to do the editing for me and do some of all these kind of things. And so what I was looking for in a publisher, I couldn't find. And so we scratched our own itch and we created it. And then it was something that we eventually offered to other authors that are out there on the scene. Yeah, and like I, I'm gonna share a little bit in a second, um, just kind of like the experience that I had with you when, when we published and really thinking about that process. But I think one of the things that probably helped you is you had your own book, right? And that was like the first book under te like your, your publishing company is, is your own, right? And I know a lot of people know you for that. They know you for the connection. And, you know, years later after being published, you know, a lot of people still refer. I actually, I don't know if you saw this the other day, but um, there was someone I connected with or I just saw them on Instagram and they have like uh, 700,000 followers on TikTok. I don't know if you even noticed this. And I just saw one of their videos and they talked about like, hey, like what are some of my influences? And, and it was, I was like, I, I dived into this gentleman's videos because I really appreciated the way that he talked about how he connected with kids, how he's very thoughtful. And he actually listed um, you, your book, and I tagged you on it just so you could see it. And he also listed uh, Paul Sol Solaire's, I don't know if I'm saying uh, the, rate, uh, the name right, he wrote uh, Learn Like a Pirate. So what, like, what is Teach Like a Pirate? Like when you, when you, if you could boil it down, you know, into like, what is, what do you mean when you say teach like a pirate? What's the context of the book? Yeah, and so that, this is a, I always tell people it has nothing to do with the dictionary definition of a pirate, everything to do with the spirit. And so to me, the spirit of a pirate is someone who is unconventional, someone who's willing to reject the status quo, someone who's willing to sail into uncharted waters with no guarantee of success, a risk taker, a rebel, a maverick. So it's <laughs> about embracing that spirit of being a pirate, right? In addition to that, it's a play on words. Pirates are known for having hooks. And this is all about all these hooks, things, engagement strategies you can add to your classroom, to your content, to draw students in almost magically and magnetically. And then finally, it's also an acronym. So the P-I-R-A-T-E of the word pirate serves as an acronym to kind of uh, structure the book. And so that's kind of the three layers of the whole pirate metaphor. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because like I talk about how good of friends you are and you're someone I can, you know, we could not talk for a while um and i could call you up and we'd have a conversation right away right away and like you have a few people like that in your life uh at, at any given time but we weren't always friends and I, I i talked to dave about this before i'm going to share a little story about the first time we actually met in person and i don't think i've ever we've kind of joked about it but we i've never actually shared this from my viewpoint to you um i remember i had first gone on twitter and uh you know, you sort of connecting and meeting new people and things like this. And I was at ASCD and I remember I was at, I was there and someone who I met um, in person and had formed a friendship with was Jimmy Cassis, who's a very good mutual friend of ours. And at the time I didn't know you, but I knew Jimmy very well. And he said to me, Hey, I'm going to go to the session uh, of Dave Burgess and I, I want to go, um, go, go see it. And I'm like, who's Dave Burgess? And he said, oh, he's the, the teach like a pirate guy. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And he, so I went there and I remember like I walked in and it was just packed. There was a ton of people there. And I think we, like I'm be, like, being honest, we've had a conversation with this. We, we actually, you know, own co-own a publishing company together. We don't always agree on everything education related, right? And that's fine. And I think, you know, I think that's, that's something that's kind of important to me is that I know the things that we do agree on that are important that we want to make sure, like how do we ensure that every kid is successful. Right. And I, I know that. Um, but we have sometimes different pathways in the ways that we get there. And I think like, it's almost like that at a point I might've thought that was bad. So I don't know you and I'm listening to some of the stuff you're saying. And I'm like, I don't agree with this guy. And I remember just ripping you on Twitter. And at the time when I saw Twitter, that was that space to really like go at people and like challenge stuff and see it. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I was like, I was going at you. And uh, 
and, and you don't know this at the time because you're speaking, right? So you don't know what's going on on Twitter. And I told Jimmy, I'm like, I'm out, I'm leaving. So I left. And it was funny because like, probably it was the only one, I think you got a standing ovation from what Jimmy told me on that same day. And, you know, so then we went out for, um, so Jimmy later messages me and <laughs> he said, Hey, um, I, I want to go, uh, let's, we're going out for dinner. So do you want to come? I'm like, yeah, sure. So we go and I think it's just Jimmy and I, right. And we get to this Mexican restaurant. Jimmy like wants to find, he, he loves Mexican restaurants. He takes us there. So we get there and it's just Jimmy and I, and he says, the person asked said, how many, um, will be sitting with you? And I'm thinking two. And Jimmy's like six. I'm like six. What are you talking about? Like who else is coming? He's like, Oh, Dave's coming. I'm like, the pirate guy. <laughs> and so, so I'm like the guy, like I literally just ripped on Twitter, right. Just ripped on Twitter. So I don't know, like, and maybe this is my perception and I don't know. Right. So you and Shelly had come there and I think a couple other people, and I know you, I know you crushed it at your thing and you look so dejected and I know you weren't happy seeing me like for, for whatever reason, because I know you knew that because I've had conversations, I think, with Shelly about it. And, and then I actually saw the impact of my words, you know, to somebody that, and, and it doesn't, and like, I'll be totally forthright. I don't know. I don't even necessarily know to this day if I would, you know, say like, no, I actually totally agree with this stuff. But the way that I said it and the way that I, like, I wasn't like personal or mean anything, but I was like, I wasn't like trying to learn more. I was just like, you're wrong. I'm right. Kind of thing. And I know, and it's like, I know that so many people like just appreciated you so much, but then I felt like I took it away. And like, I'm, I'm, all, I'm like embarrassed to say it a little bit, but I also, I, I think for me, I never talked like that on Twitter ever again. And cause I, cause I think sometimes when you don't, you don't know, like, and I, I say this, I, every time I say this, David, I think about this experience. I say like, basically that was one minute to me. That was one minute. And I walked away. I never even thought about it. Right. It's like, I'm like snarky. I'm like going to get this like little shot in. And then I feel like I just ruined your entire day. And like, but I walked away from my computer totally fine. And I was forever for that. So I am, I am grateful that, you know, you, we connected after. And I think like, I don't, we didn't just become friends that night. Like we never talked that night and I was just so embarrassed. And I think it was years after we became friends. And uh, yeah, it, it, it taught me something that I, I wish I didn't learn through someone else's uh, issue. So first of all, I apologize. Uh, obviously I'm sorry. And we've, you know, I've, you know, I've been embarrassed about this. I remember actually Jimmy posts on Instagram, uh, you and him were going for dinner one night. I'm like, wish I could be there. Cause I was just laughing. Cause I was thinking about how awkward that dinner was the entire night and how I just like, I, I felt so horrible for that. And I don't know if, I don't know how much you remember of that. I don't know, you know, what that did to you or. So please, I can tell be you. Nice though. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm no. sorry. Please be nice. I'm sorry. <laughs> So I know we have we have like talked about this a little bit before, and I've heard you uh, address it before in uh, podcasts and stuff like that. Yeah. Before. But but um, I can I can remember it absolutely one hundred percent, every single bit of it vividly. Yeah. Um, I can picture the scene. I can picture where people were. I can picture where you were sitting. I can picture where um, like I think Joe Sanfilippo was there. Uh, Joe Clark was there at the session. It, it was like a who's who of the ASCD conference was there in my session. It was jam packed, there were people along the walls. And, uh, and I remember you getting up and leaving too. And, the, um, <laughs> and, and then I can remember after everybody left and um, I was done and it's like signed some books and all the kind of stuff like this. And then went out into a space out in the like lobby journal area. And what I often do is I go through the Twitter feed and start to kind of respond to people and say, hey, thanks for coming to the session. Oh, I appreciate that or that. And I mean, it's one of those situations. I, and I saw it. I can still remember one of the tweets almost exactly word for word. I think, it was, I think he said something like, um, 
I hope this guy isn't saying that everybody has to be a magician in order to be successful as a teacher or something like that. Because <laughs> I, I have some like I did some magic in the <laughs> session, right. and so I I can even remember some of the exact right. tweets, and um, it did. It was like a sock in the stomach. I mean, and here here's what the the thing is. There's lots of people that will tell you, hey, you got to have thick skin. Just ignore that stuff. Yeah. And when people are like you run into like a hater online or something like that, like. Don't let that ruin your day. The people who say that it doesn't bother them, I think they haven't had it done to them before. Yeah. And this was just one, you, you were just one person, but like when I see sometimes like the dog pile on Twitter these days, the idea that it doesn't have an impact on that person yeah. is, just, is just not true. And so anyone who says that it doesn't have an impact, I just think they haven't been through it before then because it does have an impact on you. And I then remember that dinner and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, it was awkward because I was yeah. pissed. Well, and and like the, like, to be fair to myself, like I I I don't like I wasn't like really anything crappy or like you know I hate this gentleman or whatever saying like anything, but it was it was there was ways that I could have like I feel like disagreed with you that would have like more and I, I like it's not like i agree with everything i see on twitter right and or, or agree with every philosophy and like i said we don't necessarily always agree on things that have to do with education but that really taught me like there is a way to address this that actually honors the work that that person has done and and is still like respectful in that way and it, re it really changed my tone and i i i look back on that and i'm, I'm really grateful that we're friends and I like, gets weird because it's I, I I know like I feel bad but like I'm grateful in a way that that happened because I like sometimes we don't ever see the impact of that we don't ever see what that can do and um yeah and and you know thinking about that later and uh I remember that and I was always like every time we ever interacted after uh I was very nice to you like and and, and the way and, you, and I'm probably any educator knowing this, uh, you know, when a kid really screws up and you know, they're like a really good kid, but then they like turn it on, like, like an, up to a hundred every time they see you, because that's always stuck in their mind of like, Oh my God, I did that to that teacher. And that's how I felt. Or I'm like, like, I, I, I need to like extra make up for that. And when, um, and then we actually spoke at a conference together and and we talked about it and you're like hey like have you ever thought about writing a book and i was honored but i was like seriously this guy after what i did like and and i like i don't do you, i don't know if you remember that either right like kind yeah. of like going through that I, I still i have a picture of that moment actually yeah. of us standing together um over like by the side of the stage yeah. and chatting about it and chatting about the publishing world and um, me, me talking about like, don't don't sign a contract like don't sign a traditional contract right. before you talk like talk to me first I remember having that conversation with you and, and just to go back to that uh, original incident yeah. I think it's indicative of something that is a big problem for educators um, that we can hear like maybe you give a, a student evaluation form and 99 kids yeah. say that you're the greatest teacher ever but one kid has something negative to say and you walk away fixated on that one thing. And I mean, that's, that's the case that was for me on that day, right? Like all the, my Twitter feed was blowing up and I had, like you said, it was a standing yeah. ovation, yeah. but yet I was fixated on something that uh, you, a couple of things that you had tweeted during the session. And so I, I think there's, that's kind of a dysfunctional part of yeah. ourselves that, you know, I, I think that we need to work on. And the other part of it is, and you addressed this earlier, is it's not to say that you and I still don't have disagreements on some of those things that you were tweeting about, and that's totally okay. And um, so it's, it's not about a, just a blanket agreement with someone whose philosophical ideas maybe you have some issue with, but it is, it is an issue of the approach. And you wrote something brilliant about this that I still reference all the time. And you wrote a blog post about, um, I think there was three things to look at before you give critical feedback to somebody mm -hmm. or before you accept critical feedback from somebody as well. 
And one of those things is, do you have a relationship with this person? Have you ever shared with this person uh, your appreciation for their contributions? So before you're giving critical feedback, do they know that you care about them and that you, that you appreciate them? And, and, and the, I think the second thing uh, was, do you only approach this person when you have something negative to say, or do you give them positive feedback as well? And then I think the third person was, are you open to being critiqued in the same way that you're about ready to critique this person? And so I-, I, I You actually that remember that way better than I do remember. Like I remember that blog post, I'm like, yeah, I did say all that, but I would have never remembered those three points. <laughs> yeah, I, re I reference that all the time. If I'm talking to people about, you know, when they're dealing with um, criticism, haters, trolls, all that kind of stuff like that, as I reference those three things that you pointed out. Well, and so what's interesting is that when you, when you, when you say that, up until that point, I would say that I was, um, like if I popped into a blog, it was to disagree. It was to say you're wrong. It was to do that, right? And, but I never saw the person. Do you know what I mean? I think that's what really changed things for me is that I saw you. And, you know, and some like, and, you know, some people are like, I can't believe you did that. And like, I think, I, like, I, I always say is like, you know, we've all like, hopefully we grow. And I think it, it's important for me to share like, hey, like, there's things I've done wrong that I'm trying to get better and trying to do that. And I, you know, it was, it was, um, yeah, that, that really, got me thinking because that that is something that a lot of times when I uh, Joe Sanfilippo shared this with me he said don't take criticism from someone you wouldn't take advice from and I think that's really uh, that's a really important concept but it is hard when you're like you're exhausted and you're trying to like do your best at whatever you're trying to do right and uh, you know like all of us I think like I'm, I'm an educator, but I'm more of a dad, right? I'm, I'm more of a guy that has a family and there's a lot of things that I deal with in any single day that are not having to do with education. And then it feels like things are piling on. And I just, um, yeah, I, I never, I was talking to a group yesterday and I think one of the things that I say today, and I'm, I'm very thoughtful is that I want to be, my goal every day is to be the best interaction every person I come across has. And I don't always do it. And sometimes I could be the, the worst, but I, I never set out to be that. And I try to that. And I think from those failures, because we always talk about sharing our failures and there I shared a failure, you know, should come growth. And that, that was a, a big learning for me. And I, I think it's something that, you know, I've grown a lot from. And when you talked to me at that day, um, you know, your, your company was new. There wasn't, uh, I think you maybe had two or three books at the time when you first approached me. And it was, um, to be honest with you, for me, I felt that there was a little bit of a risk at that point in my career, right, to do this, because I don't know much. And, uh, and what, what had happened is that I had shared, the, shared a copy of what I had written already. And I gave it to you and Shelly. And just to step back a second, I had shared that same co copy elsewhere. And someone said, no, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to write like this. And I was like, nah, that's not me. That's like, that's not, that's not who I am. And I don't want to just write in a way that someone else wants me to. And so I, I was like, I still wanted to write a book, but it really stung. And then I gave you the, the exact same version to you and Shelly. And you're just like, we love this. And the thing that I really appreciate about your work is that you want people to share their voice. You don't want to make them like, that's, you know, and that's why I talk about, like we have disagreements on stuff. I guarantee you don't agree with everything I've wrote in Innovator's Mindset or things like that, but you didn't want to like mold me to your, you know, vision of what education would be, you wanted me to, and you even said this, you wanted to, me to have my own like manifesto of like education and thinking about that. So that's something that you've really done with your authors. And so can you talk about like why that's so important to you uh, in your work? Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that, that is one of the things that we talk about with every single author, we give them the manifesto speech Yeah. and we say, listen, like we, M, the, there's an acronym. The M stands for manifesto. We want you to write your manifesto. 
We want you to write the core message that you want to share with other educators in the world. Like if you could give a TED talk next week, this would be your TED talk. Like we want your TED talk speech, right? If you could give a keynote at the biggest conference in the nation, like this would be your keynote topic. This is the kind of thing that after you're done giving it, you would just want to like slam the mic down and break it because who the heck's going to step on the stage after what you just said? You just crushed it. But then here's the problem is that, um, we think that writers have to go almost over the top in their writing to have that same sort of emotional impact as a writer they do as a speaker. Because like if I sat down and had a meal with you, certainly not after ASCD, but if I sat down and had a meal with you and you told me about your work, um, like I would be able to see your facial expressions, your intonation, uh, the, the inflection in your voice. Maybe you would gesture if you got excited about a point you were making. But then the, that same person could be so passionate about their, their work, will sit down at a computer and now all of a sudden they feel they have to be real formal, professional, academic, because the book always has to be so serious. It has to fit into this little formula and recipe and all that. And we just like toss that away and say like, no, like this is like, we want you to take all of your best stuff from when you're speaking, from your blogging, all this stuff and, and, and wrap it together and create your manifesto. Now manifesto gets a bad rap in the world mm -hmm. as a word, because when you usually hear it, it's when a serial killer leaves one behind. Right. You know, like they'll say they killed 10 people and left the manifesto in the basement or something like that. But we look at it in a positive sense. Like this is your legacy. This is your moment. Like nobody likes lukewarm. So you don't have to shave off the edges of your of uh, uh, the right, like the roughness of your message. You don't have to fit into any particular box. We just want you to share your voice and, and we're going to try to amplify it for you. Yeah, it's funny, like like talking about things that, you know, we literally uh, own Impress together um, and we've published and we did, like I said, we don't have always the same philosophy. I don't know if you remember this, but when we met, when we, when we actually met, I said to you like, Hey, like I'm not into like acronyms and I'm not going to do like an acronym book. And that's, uh, that's me. I remember you kind of being awkward. You're like, well, here's the acronym for our company. And, I, and it was like funny because I have not like at the time I'm like, okay, hey, that's like, that's not good. Right now. The difference is, is that I'm like, that's not for me, but for somebody that actually makes sense. Right. And it's like, that was like a, that's been like a big shift for me. And I, and like I said, that's why we kind of work well together. And when I used to like look at who I'd hire as my admin partners, I didn't need another George. I already had George. George. I already thought the way I did. I needed someone who thought a little bit different, who thought that. But again, like, like I said, I think the, the shared mission that we have with Impress and the shared mission of work that we do is we want to make sure that people are successful um, in ways that are meaningful to them. We want to make sure that every kid gets what they need in education and has an opportunity to be successful. But we also believe there's different ways we can get there, but we're all kind of working toward the same goal. And I, I know that, you know, that you've learned from me, I've learned from you. And so when you, when you look at your business and you look at the work that you do uh, as a publisher and connecting, and what did you learn as a teacher, as an educator that has helped you in, on the business aspect of the work you do? What have I learned as a teacher that's helped me in business? Yeah, like what, what, did, you, what did you take in the classroom that you know, things that you learned in the classroom that helped you with the work that you do with publishing? I think that the, you connect with different kids in different ways. And so that not every single strategy that you use in the classroom is gonna be a, a, a match for every, uh, for every student. And the same thing is true of books. And that I don't want a line of books, which is all teach like a pirate in style. Right because my style is gonna resonate maybe with a certain amount of teachers and with their, a certain amount of their student population. But it's an understanding that that's not the full story. I told my story in Teach Like a Pirate. I wrote my manifesto. And so like people always ask, are you gonna write Teach Like a Pirate part two or whatever that might sound like? I'm, like, I'm not writing Teach Like a Pirate part two. I, I told my story. And now I'm looking to try to amplify the voices of other educators who are using other strategies and other techniques because those are going to be those are going to be a better match for a, another population of kids, and so just like we don't always go to the same strategy as a teacher because we know we have a variety of kids in front of us, I think the same thing is true of us in the publishing line too. 
is that we, we don't want books that fit into a particular box. We want books that are kind of all over the map because there's different styles of teachers and there's different styles of kids. So like, as I'm listening to you and thinking about that and how important that is, I, I remember when I talked to you, like I had wanted to write a book and, but I was like so dejected about some of the feedback that I got. And I was like, uh, maybe, you know, maybe my ideas aren't uh, that great. You know, maybe that, maybe it's not, this is not for me. And I don't know if you remember this, but I was like, yeah, like maybe I could write like lead like a pirate. And I don't know if you remember that. And Shelly was like, um, I think we already got someone for that. Like, I, right. And so I felt, hey, what I'm doing is not working. So I'm going to just try to fit into your mold and, you know, see if that works. But you were adamant. And I think that that makes a really good point on like what you're talking about. Like, no, what you're doing is you. Like, we want you to do that. And so like, I was just saying like, you know, and I think a lot of times we do that as opposed to, you know, kind of kind of bringing out, you know, yourself and, and, and bringing out um, that, that process. So, you know, if someone's like looking to maybe thinking about education or even thinking about, starting you know something new starting a business like you did and like what what would advice would you give to them as they they're starting up yeah so i think that uh one of, one of my favorite quotes comes from seth godin mm. and he said reject the tyranny of picked pick yourself and yeah. so you don't have to raise your hand you don't have to be selected you don't have to be chosen you if you have some sort of work that you want to put in the world business you want to start a book you want to write you don't have to be selected. You can do it yourself. And that's, that's like one of the things that's always a disappointment for me sometimes is when someone submits a book to me and we decide to pass on it and they say, oh my God, like it was my dream to write a book. And then they like act like it's over at that point. It's like, well, wait a second. You don't need my approval to write a book. Anybody can write a book. If your book's on Amazon, you're for real. And anyone can be on Amazon. So you need to, I, I think that too many people are waiting to be tapped on the shoulder and selected and uh, rather than just, rather than taking the risk and putting their work out into the world. And, I, and one of the things that you've helped a lot of people do, which I think is really important too, is um, start, start small, start with a blog, yeah. start sharing your thoughts with an authentic audience. And then you're gonna see what resonates, what works, what doesn't work. You're gonna get a chance to hone and craft your message and improve your, and improve your writing in front of an authentic audience and then you're going to have a book. Too many people come and say like, hey, I want to write a book and then go speak. And I always tell them, no, 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 wait, wait, go speak and then write a book. Because when you go speak, yeah. you're going to have real eyes staring at you. And you're going to have that authentic audience. And you're going to see what hits and what doesn't hit. You're going to see what slide you put up that they put. everyone puts their phone up and wants to get a picture of. You're going to be able to see your social media feed afterwards and see what resonated with people. People are going to come up to you after the speech and say, hey, I really love when you talk about this. Or maybe like I would love some more information about this. You're like, oh, that's an area I need to flesh out. Everybody wants more information on, on this part of my, uh, my workshop. And so I think that's something that you have done so effectively for so many people and so many people have pointed to you of getting them started on their blogging career, which eventually then has turned into a lot of cases books. Yeah, it's funny because the, the one of the things that I don't know if a lot of people know about me is I started blogging, not because I'm like, oh, I need to get my voice out there. I want to talk about education. The sole purpose that I started a blog was we were looking at doing digital portfolios in school for our kids. And I'm like, we don't know what we're doing. Like nobody's ever done this. So I should try to figure this out as a principal. So I just started my own portfolio um, as an administrator. And then I started sharing stuff and then people started like sharing it and saying it resonated. I'm like, oh, like, and then I started getting into it. And the, the, one of the best stories, I do not know where this story comes from and I've shared it 10 million times. And I think it's a really powerful thing is that um, it, it is about just getting started, right? It is about getting that process. And um, it was this, there's a story, it's like an internet meme story that um, a mom was talking to her daughter and her daughter was 19 years old and she wanted to become a doctor. And she said, look, I want to become a doctor, but I'm not going to be I, like, it's going to, I'm not going to be a doctor until I'm 30 years old, right? It's going to take so much time and effort to be that. And the mom said, you know what? In 11 years, you're going to be 30 anyway. So why not be a doctor? 
right? And I think that's a lot of people see, they're so looking at the future and they see that work that's there, but understanding that if you just get started, that's, that's, that's the only time you're gonna get to that place. And so that, that to me has always been something that's really kind of helped me uh, get through this. And I agree with you, it's really kind of about kind of getting started and, and sharing. So uh, as we enter 2021, and you know 2020 quite the year it's not one that we're like we'll always look back on this right uh and you know I, like this is you know the longest two weeks of my life the two-week quarantine that we've been under for a year kind of thing uh what like what advice do you give teachers going into this year or like maybe not even just teachers but you know anybody as you as you look into 2021 yeah, so I think that, and lots of people have talked about this, but I think it's a time for intentional self-care and to make sure that uh, you're pouring into yourself. I know that, that fitness has become, fitness and wellness has become something that's been huge in your life during this time, something that's become huge in my life during this time, during Shelley, Shelley's life during this time. And so I think that I am going to be hitting 2021 stronger and uh, doing better than ever before, partly because of that. And that's something that I want to have continue. And as far as educationally going, I, I think there's going to be some great opportunities that come out of this. And, you know, one of your, one of your more famous quotes is change is an opportunity to do something amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And this has provided that opportunity. And of course, there's been lots of tragedy that has come along with it, unfortunately, for a lot of people, but also opportunity. And now we have a whole new skill set um, as an educational community of ways of connecting with kids, ways of delivering content. And we have a, a whole group of teachers who are very maybe tech resistant in the past, or um, were kind of rejecting blended models of education because they didn't really know that much about it. And now because of this situation, we're gonna be able to kind of almost start over again where we have all of the old ways, which maybe some of them are gonna be very effective for us to continue, but we also have some new strategies and some new educational innovations. And I think that when we come forward, I think we're gonna be able to kind of meld these things together, hopefully, and to create something which is ultimately gonna be better. Yeah, and like, I, I hope that, and this is obviously something I've been talking about forever, is that when we look at this year and, and the, like the, the innovation is not about a thing, it's not about a program, it's not about a technology it comes from people and it, it comes from people understanding what is needed and you know looking at hey are we you know let's say we're back to where we were in 2019 it wasn't like we were just knocking out of the park with you know focusing on social emotional learning for adults or even our students so like we can talk about how 2020 was way worse but it wasn't like great before and so I think that it's brought it to the forefront and the innovation is going to be to like people thinking differently about like, how do we ensure that we take care of our people? How do we ensure that they get what they need? So they're not coming to school exhausted. Right. And uh, I've always believed that it's really important for to, you know, have educators that education is a passion, not just a job, but it cannot be the only thing. It can't be the only thing that, surrounds it. like you, you really do like you know it's important that I know you love kids you, you want them to be successful but you, ha you have to kind of you have to love yourself too you have to make sure that you're fine because it's it's no matter what like every year it's like it's uh, like I've seen a lot of people you know I've always thought educators were working as hard as possible and then I saw this year and there's never been a year that teachers weren't working their butts off that they weren't exhausted and I just hopefully you know we we continue to do that and um, as we go in education so on a personal it, level oh sorry go ahead Dave. yeah I was gonna say the other thing I think that uh, hopefully comes out of this is there's been um, I think there's been this big thought that change has to be slow in education people mm -hmm. will tell you that all the time I like, don't expect teachers to embrace this right away this is going to take years to roll out and the kind of the educational shift takes a, a long time to turn and now because of disruption and an unfortunate disruption with the pandemic, we saw that education can shift very quickly, can be very flexible and teachers can be incredibly creative, innovative and, and, and collaborate with each other in all new ways. 
And so hopefully coming out of the pandemic, we've kind of left behind that whole sense that change in education has to be slow. Mm. Uh, we can do these things and we, and we can, and I think we can do, do them quickly. So on a, on a personal note, um, we did a little 10 minute segment before I asked you two questions and I uh, asked you one who was like a teacher that inspired you and you talked about John Wooden. So you are a, um, you're a pretty big basketball. Like how did you end up um, working with John Wooden, you're a pretty big basketball guy when you're younger, correct? Absolutely. I lived and died basketball. Uh, my first job as a human being is I worked for three summers for John Wooden at the John Wooden basketball camps in um, Thousand Oaks, California. Uh, my first job in a school system was I was hired as a basketball coach. I got hired as the boys junior varsity basketball coach at a high school. Um, went back at night school, loved it so much, went back at night school and got my teacher credential. Eventually uh, became the varsity basketball coach for the girls program. Uh, at the high school that I was teaching at. Who was your, who was your team growing up? It was Lakers, right? It was not the Lakers. So uh, my no. team, so growing up, I was a huge uh, Philadelphia 76ers fan back in the Dr. J era. So uh, I can still remember the, um, and uh, rest in peace to my father because the deal was on Sunday. So this was before you could get basketball anytime on television, right? It was Sunday, Sundays on CBS. That was like the one game of the week where you could watch. And, they, uh, and if the Philadelphia 76ers were play, playing on that Sunday, I didn't have to go to church with the family. I could stay home <laughs> and, and watch Dr. J because Dr. J was my favorite player. So, I mean, that was back in the days of like uh, Lloyd uh, Free or World Be Free, Daryl Dawkins, um, uh, Dr. J, Andrew, Tony, like all, it was uh, Bobby Jones at four. Like that, I, that was my team back growing up. Yeah, and it's funny, like, I don't know if you know this about me, but, um, like, it's, I, like, you know I love basketball, and uh, I grew up a big Lakers fan, and I know you're close there, but I'm probably, I feel like I'm more of a Raptors fan now, but, like, I played high school basketball, I played, you know, I didn't play in college or anything like that, uh, but I, I still played until I, in, my whole goal was to become a basketball coach. Like teaching was secondary and it's a different system in Canada because you don't get paid to coach, right? It's all volunteer. So um, I, I coached um, for years and I actually had a, um, I was uh, one of the top applicants, like I was being considered for a, a coaching job at a high school in Fresno, uh, in Fresno, California. And they were considering me. I was so excited. I'm like, wow, this is like a dream come true. And there was, uh, there was immigration issues for me to actually go and coach. So it didn't work out and I was destroyed. And the reason I share that is because that was something that I wanted so bad, you know, was like, felt like it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to like coach. Now I, I, I loved education. I love teaching, but I, I've always loved basketball. And in that same place, uh, years later, uh, that didn't hire me, I actually keynoted, right? And I said, hey, just so you know, you, I almost got this job uh, coaching here, but you didn't give it to me. So I guess this is what I do now, right? And they actually, they, no one had a clue that actually happened. And the reason that I share that story is because, um, just a reminder, and I'm sure you have a story like this too, that sometimes the best thing that can happen you is being rejected from something is something not happening for you that you think is going to be everything at that moment, but it can lead you into a better direction, but it is important that you take advantage of that. Do you have any story like that where, you know, something didn't work out? Cause like you've had great success, but I'm sure not everything. Well, maybe it does because your first job was like the best job in the world. So <laughs> I don't know, but like, do you ever have any of those things that you look back at and you're like, I wish this happened, but it turned out it was better. Than it didn't. Yeah, so I had a long journey to teaching, actually, because uh, I was kind of fairly late to the game. And I tried all sorts of different entrepreneurial ventures early on. So I've always had an interest in marketing, entrepreneurship, um, sales. And so most of the reading that I was doing in my 20s was um, success literature and entrepreneurship. And I was doing all sorts of wild, crazy things. And eventually it was just like, you know what? I'm I, I took the basketball coaching job just to get a spot, just, you know, or the afternoons and evenings. And, and then that's when it was like, you know, why am I fighting this? Like, I, I'm, I love working with kids and I, I got the teaching, and I got the teaching job eventually, but 
all that time that I spent messing around, trying all these wild ventures and reading about entrepreneurship and marketing and all of that, eventually turned out to be what my ultimate career was going to be with both write, you know, writing, publishing the book, speaking, and, and running the publishing business. And so it all worked out in the long run. It was just, it just it seems like a, uh, you know, there's no direct line between it. But in the, in, in the end, that time that I spent floundering in my early to mid-20s was kind of the foundation for a later success. Yeah, and, and Dave, you, you, you probably won't say this yourself, and so I'm going to say it for you, the, the reality of that like you, you know, you're known for your speaking, um, you know, successful business, obviously, you know, how great of a keynote you are and doing that too. But for me, the thing that I really appreciate about you and I look up to is all of the people that you have elevated, all of the people that you and Shelly together have really given a voice to and in a way to share something that's not in a way that you, not in a way that you wanted them to, but you wanted them to share who they were and what mattered to them. And so I, when I look at my success, you know, for lack of a better term, how I would measure that is how many people have excelled because of maybe something I've said or something I've done or, you know, share that work. And I think that you are just a great example of that and someone that, you know, I consider a very good friend, but also look up to because you've done that for so many people. So I just want to say that I, I am grateful that um, you took a chance. I, and I felt I was taking a chance on you, but I feel you're just taking as much a chance on me when I, when I wrote Innovator's Mindset. And I know that it's uh, changed my life significantly to have that opportunity to share a voice. And uh, at least my mom likes it, right? So that she's uh, pretty proud of me to do that. But I, I just want to take the time um, to thank you. And so do you have any last words for um, educators out there as they go into the year? Yeah, you know, so I think the um, get connected. And I think that's another thing that you've done so brilliantly throughout your career is uh, there's all kinds of people that tell me, oh yeah, it was George who got me on Twitter for the first time. It was George that got me involved in it. I got an, I, we just had two authors publish a book yeah. and where do they meet? They met in iMOOC, which was a space that you created for teachers to connect and collaborate. So I think that's um, you know, heading into 2021. If you are not a connected educator, if you're not collaborating with people, not just in your system, but across the, across the board and building those connections, that's something that I think you should do. And um, you know, thank you for all those kind words and right back at you. It's been an honor to work with you and just to see your impact that your work has had on school systems and teachers and kids. And like I said, I get every week, Someone is telling me like, oh, like the re I'm here because uh, George said I needed to get connected or George said I needed to start a blog. And so we've had a huge impact on amplifying the message of other people as well. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm a big advocate of, you know, being connected. But one of the things that too, that I think is important is like, uh, be thoughtful of, you know, when you connect that you're connecting yourself with people that will uh, push you, but got your back. And that's when I look at you, um, you have made me a better educator, but I've always known you have my back, even, <laughs> even after my tweets that one day. So, um, I'm very grateful to you, uh, and to your family and all that you've done for me. And I know many people have the same. So thanks everyone for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks Dave for starting off the year for everyone. Right. Thanks. <laughs>